Good afternoon, everybody. Are we enjoying the VR demos? Cool stuff here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about some things that we've been doing at, at USC's Institute for Creative Technologies and a couple other places. Uh, we've been around for 15 years uh, out on the west side here of Los Angeles. And when they started our institute back in 99, 2000, the idea was to, to try to bring about the next generation of virtual reality. So. Uh, mission accomplished and uh, now we've got that today. A big part that we've been looking at is trying to create the content that you would see in simulated experiences and trying to make it look very realistic so it has the ability to engage a lot of the senses that we have when we're dealing with the real world. And the hardest piece of content to try to develop uh, was certainly the virtual characters that you would see in a simulated experience. So one of the technologies that we've worked with quite a bit has been uh, scanning faces and trying to create photoreal digital actors. So uh, some of our devices are these spheres of LEDs. We use them in various ways. They're called light stages. And one of our techniques uses a special set of lighting patterns that are polarized spherical lighting. They isolate the specular reflection of the skin. They see how light plays off of it from different directions. And it helps us build digital actors like Digital Emily here that we did in collaboration with uh, Image Metrics back in 2008. And what's notable is we can get very high resolution detail of faces that's actually accurate down to the level of skin pores and fine creases. And since the Digital Emily project, it's actually been used in a number of uh, commercial uh, projects, particularly uh, movies. Here are uh, a couple of them that it's been used. We did a project with the Smithsonian for the National Portrait Gallery uh, last summer, which was pretty exciting. Um, Oblivion, I think Matthias Wittmann over here helped uh, with that, uh, getting a digital double for uh, Tom Cruise. Uh, but all of these things were uh, things that were you know, going up on a movie screen where it's okay to render things for two hours. In VR, it has to run in real time. And our collaborations with the video game industry have helped show that we will be able to achieve photoreal digital actors in real time one way or another. And a collaboration that we had with Activision back in 2013 was called the Digital IRA Project um, to try to create a real-time digital actor. That was all rendered in real time. Um, we took our friend Ari Shapiro, he's another graphics researcher at USC ICT, got lots of scans of his face, high resolution, tenth of a millimeter detail. Sorry there's no eyes here, a little creepy. But we are transitioning between his different expressions which have been put into the same animation space down to subpixel accuracy. And then if we record video of him on all of our light stage cameras, we can record facial performances that we'll then use to drive his facial rig that's been built. So this is a color-coded version of which facial expression he's making as he performs after we've tracked it uh, four-dimensionally. And it'll blend in the texture maps and the normal maps and all of the skin detail uh, as he moves around there. Now it's looking like the video might have gotten a little darker. Is, can everyone else see that okay? I don't know what's going on with the projector. I think, did we lose some projector? Can someone check on that? I have very interesting things to say as well, but I think honestly the visuals are probably better than any of that, so let's see if we can get that. We might have lost a bulb here or something. Was it brighter before? Uh-oh. Any questions so far? Is it better now? Okay. That's the NVIDIA version. Well, let's see. We're calling them, okay? Okay, I will, tr I will try to meander on as much as possible because we got to keep, keep moving here. But anyway, what was cool about this project is that Activision was able to get a version of Digital IRA rendering in real time, uh, pretty realistically, uh, on what was in 2013 a two-year-old laptop. So this is stuff that the next generation of Activision's video games, they actually have a light stage working there. Uh, they will be uh, having... Um, uh, characters that look at least as good as Digital Ira. And that means that in virtual reality, at least for the ones tethered to consoles, uh, characters can look uh, as realistic at that and have that skin detail and that level of facial performance. And I think that'll be very important because digital characters are something that we need to be interactive. Once they're there in a virtual environment with us, uh, it's so much more important because it feels like there's a person in front of you that they have to be uh, interactive, able to you know, track you with their gaze and move around. 
uh, appropriately. It's going to put a lot of great um, uh, incentivization on artificial intelligence to have better simulations of how people behave because now we can finally make it feel like there's you know an another person there uh, in the room with you. Um, what I'm going to try to do, just to see if it helps, is I'm going to go to a different display resolution. And we'll see, see that's better? OK, so now we're theorizing. I'm going I'm to just dial back here. OK. OK, so if this comes back, we're going to be doing a little less bandwidth onto the display. And let's see if it keeps up with it any better. I'll use this as a test. Okay, let's just let's keep going here. Um, so that's a technique for using cameras, photographing from different viewpoints to try to digitize a person and put it into virtual reality. What I'd like to switch over to is talking about um, a bit of work over the years that has been aimed at trying to take environments and then taking pictures of them from various directions and trying to put those into virtual reality. And in Gosh, dating myself, 1994, I was a summer intern at Interval Research Corporation, uh, which is Paul Allen's think tank uh, at the time. And I got to work for a media artist, a uh, really cool guy named Michael Neymark, you'll see him in the upper left, uh, who'd been on all, doing all sorts of interesting things with cameras and video projectors in his career. And his project for the summer was taking footage that he had shot in Banff National Forest with this special instrumented baby stroller that had two 16 millimeter Bolex cameras, and it was instrumented so that every time he rolled it forward a meter, it would take another stereo pair. And he had this you know, digitized professionally, so it was pretty good quality imagery for the time, with all of these stereo pairs. It was kind of hyper stereo, eight inches apart, so it wasn't really designed to be seen directly. The idea was to um, actually run computer vision techniques on it to get depth maps, so if a computer program uh, takes a look at uh, a left image and a right image and figures out which pixels here or which pixels here, the stuff that's really far away is going to be in the same place. But things that get closer and closer relative to the cameras are going to have more and more of a shift from one view to the other, just like you know, your finger shifts a lot when you do your uh, eyes back and forth there. So uh, the computer detects these disparities between the images by matching pixel regions. It gets a depth map tends to have little troubles around the edges of things. That's getting better these days. But once you have a depth map and an image, you can texture map the image onto the depth map, and then you can generate virtual views of the scene as it, like a 3D point cloud. And so back in the summer of 94, I got to work on this uh, project with John Woodfill and Michael Neymark. And these are some virtual, not artifact free, but virtual explorations of the Banff National Forest, kind of moving backwards and forwards. And what actually ended up really starting to work is cross-dissolving between different stereo pairs as you render them forward going down the trail. It made a very smooth view. And then you could actually generate just about any view that you would need around in here. So this actually would have been pretty interesting material if we'd had good VR headsets back then to look at because you get a stereo view and you can actually virtually render just about anywhere that your head would be on the trail, at least looking for 90 degrees field of view uh, forward. Um, and the reason that we were able to do this without explicitly doing any 3D models of trees or laser scans or anything is that we were really capturing lots of the light that was actually there in the scene. Uh, the next year at SIGGRAPH 95, there was the first paper uh, in that wave of image-based modeling and rendering research called Planoptic Modeling by uh, Macmillan and Bishop. And they uh, put forth this terminology of a function that can characterize the color and intensity of every ray of light in space. So you can think of this as all of the data that could make up any picture that anybody could possibly take at a given moment of time. And so there's five numbers here. There's a uh, VX, a VY, a VZ, a theta, and a phi. So you'd say, OK, from this position, x, y, z, I'm going to look in direction theta around the horizon and then phi of inclination. That specifies a ray in space. And now whatever color I see is that little pixel, the amount of red, the amount of green, the amount of blue, that's our pixel value. And if you think about it, you can put your 
XYZ anywhere. You can put in the Grand Canyon and then read out thetas and fees and pull out a panorama of the Grand Canyon. You can put it in the middle of this room. Uh, this is what VR cameras are trying to capture, um, pieces of the planoptic function. They actually put together a bit of a VR camera at the time. They kind of had a video camera and they just spun it around and they took like the, the middle section of the image as it went around and they got panoramas. So this looks pretty familiar. And they actually even moved it uh, forward and back on a rail and they got these panoramas moving through space. And they also then figured out how to correspond pixels in like the first panorama to the second panorama to determine what was going to be the three-dimensional depth that you would see in the scene. Uh, here you have to look for pixels along curvy lines instead of straight lines like you do with rectilinear images. And then they got depth and from the depth they were able to then have panoramic images you could look around everywhere and uh, render a virtual view uh, of the scene. And again, this is all happening without any laser scanners or any 3D models or any uh, geometry. So they tended to be zoomed in a little far and it's a little spastic, but they had, a, you know, for 20 years ago, a pretty good visualization of what's going on here. And we'll see a couple of re-renderings of the scene. And they're able to virtually move the viewpoint. Now when you disocclude something behind like one of the columns or one of the trees, then you'll have some black areas or you have to fill those in with hole filling algorithms. But it was kind of a new way of thinking of ways to model and uh, render a scene. Um, the next year was like the big year at SIGGRAPH for image-based modeling uh, and rendering. And one of the papers presented in that session, the last paper of the session, was called Light Field Rendering uh, by Mark Lavoie and Pat Hanrahan from SIGGRAPH 96. So if there's any one paper that's emblematic of the light field uh, technique, uh, it would be this paper here. And essentially, we know that if somehow you could go and photograph the planoptic function, you could take a, a Ricoh Theta 360 which gets all theta and phi as you go around there, um, and then just move it to every x, y, z position in space, you'd record the planoptic function, you could create anything. Um, that's actually a little bit redundant because uh, the pixel color that is available coming along to this rate at this point is probably gonna be the same pixel color coming from this same direction of ray to this point if they're along the same line, that is, a ray of light tends to stay the same color and intensity as it moves through empty space. Now, if you've got uh, participating media, if you're going through a lot of smog, which might happen in Los Angeles over long distances, that doesn't, uh, that isn't true. But if you're in a typical VR environment that's like, you know, the interior of our concert hall or something, this is accurate enough. And because of that, since there's this whole 1D family of rays that have exactly the same color and intensity along this, this uh, row, there's really uh, one dimension fewer of information uh, out there in the light than the planoptic function would represent. So those are kind of redundant. And light fields are thus four dimensional data structures that are only interested in what line of light it's coming from, not specifically where it ends up. And that ends up making a pretty cool thing uh, happen. Uh, suppose that we have an object here, and this is from their original 96 uh, presentation, and I have no idea what object they meant to depict with this particular <laughs> thing here, um, but let's imagine it's something wonderful. And uh, these are cameras that photographed it from different positions, and of course each camera has a bunch of pixels, and every pixel represents uh, a ray of light that arrived at the nodal point uh, of the camera. So if you have, you know, relatively dense sampling, of images around this circle, say that you, you know, spin the object around or you move the camera around, uh, it's clear that you can then just grab any one of those images and then have a view of it from any angle that you would want. But you didn't take any pictures closer or further away than whatever the distance the cameras were to the object when you shot all of this stuff. The cool thing about light fields is that you can accurately generate images of the scene closer than the original array of cameras and further away than the original array of cameras with all of the correct perspective cues. Lines will converge in the right way. It's actually the right image that's what you would have taken if the camera was actually there. And so that's what they're showing right here. This is a virtual camera. Suppose we wanted to take a picture of this object from closer up. 
and you didn't actually record all of these rays from here. The observation is that if you trace back all these rays of light that you needed to form what those pixels were supposed to be, that you recorded those rays accurately, if you just come back to this surface that had all the cameras on it, and you look up this pixel of this camera, and then for this pixel of the image, you look up a different pixel from this camera and a different pixel from this camera. And so as long as all the rays of light that are converging on you eventually would go back through your head and hit cameras that recorded them, or if you're standing behind the position where the array of cameras was and all those cameras are basically would have been in your way, they would have recorded the light that was necessary to generate the views that you would see from your two eyes over here. So you get light fields by basically taking a camera and moving it over a two-dimensional set of positions and, and uh, getting this four-dimensional data structure. They're often parameterized uh, in terms of um, where does each line of light hit two planes at different uh, distances. So U, V, and ST is enough to say uh, what any ray of light would be. And then this is the uh, video that they put together from 96 to show the, the concept. This is a nicely rendered uh, 3D scanned dragon, but there's no 3D geometry in this visualization. It's all being rendered as light fields, and they're able to move in and out, get the right perspectives, change the viewpoint. It's got some nice shine to it. And at the time, it was just a small little thing, but one of the attractive things about this uh, is that it renders very fast, because it's not actually doing any rendering. It's just looking up images, and you can see that if you're at the same distance as the cameras, it's just grabbing actual images that you took. But as you get closer or further, it starts binning together different pixels from different views to grab bits of that view, bits of that view, bits of that view to generate a view that's further forward or further back uh, from the original points of view. Uh, actually, 20 minutes before the light field paper was presented at SIGGRAPH 96, there was another paper that had pretty much the same concept called the Lumograph. It wasn't quite as cool a name for it. That one didn't stick. Uh, but they actually did a little bit more than the light field paper in that they projected all of this three-dimensional or this, this, this 40 set of rays onto a rough three-dimensional model of the scene. So here they had this fluffy toy which would be hard to represent in computer graphics because it's you know, not like surfaces with texture maps really. Um, and they did a volumetric reconstruction from its silhouettes by moving a camera around here. And then they projected all those images back onto the three-dimensional shape that they had. And as a result, they got a more finely focused light field that was sharper using fewer uh, additional input images. And in fact, 40 minutes before this paper, I was presenting something called facade, uh, modeling and rendering architecture from photographs, which was based on my PhD thesis. And I'd been walking around buildings, taking pictures of them, uh, reconstructing three-dimensional geometry, figuring out where the photos were. And when it came time to texture map these models from the different images, I realized that for any given point on our model, we might have several different cameras that saw it from different angles. And instead of choosing one of those as the texture map that we'd use, I decided that I would do something called view-dependent texture mapping. So if we're viewing the scene from this angle and we had a photo from around here, that's what we'd project onto the building with projection mapping. And then if we moved around, it would actually cross-dissolve to another image, which ended up producing something that's essentially the same concept as light fields that are located on the surface of three-dimensional geometry. And we used that to actually render the Berkeley Tower as we flew around it for a little film that we made called the Campanile movie. And because of that, even relatively simple geometry could look relatively rich uh, and interesting and realistic. More importantly, or what was particularly exciting about this, is that all this imagery back in 1997 rendered in real time. We had a silicon graphics machine with texture memory and even though it looks like it's got global illumination, well, it does because the real light actually did all of those nice lighting effects, um, it was just stored in textures and we could render it very, very quickly. And that's very relevant to VR. VR, you need to have a really high frame rate or else the connection between how you move your head, uh, rotate it, and translate it, and what the images are doing gets broken and that's when you feel like you need to lay down for a bit. And another project that I got to be aware of uh, through my connection to Interval Research Corporation was a very nice paper uh, done by Gavin Miller and his colleagues. He's now at Adobe, um, where they came up with a, uh, a head-mounted display. They wanted to figure out just how fast 
does update rate need to be in virtual reality in order to really believe that it's reacting uh, to your head motions and you think it's a solid form that's right there. And they actually used a form of light field rendering of pre-rendered images of this interesting uh, sculpture over here. Um, and they hooked this head mount up to a, uh, um, a, mo a motion arm, so they didn't have the little camera out there doing the head tracking. They had a physical you know, beam doing that. But that had less than one millisecond of latency. And by doing light field rendering and actually changing the view of the scene as the scan line of the monitor went down, they could say that they were getting less than one millisecond latency on this device. And then you'd move back and forth and just see whether you believed that that thing was actually solid and, and not squishing around. And they found actually that for most subjects, uh, you need to have 75 frames per second or so before the illusion is really complete. And that's exactly uh, what uh, a lot of the VR systems are trying to target. So we've known that for some time. Um, the uh, company Otoy, which I do some work with because they actually have a, have a light stage they operate up in uh, Burbank, at last year's SIGGRAPH, they demonstrated some very interesting light fields rendered out of their Octane renderer. And their octane renderer is super fast. These are interactive global illumination renderings with all of the bounces of light and specular reflections and cool things that make stuff look realistic happening. But it's not full quality at 75 frames per second. There's an immense amount of cloud computing that's going into producing these things. And so at first, things are going to be a little bit noisy until you let it render for a few seconds, and then it looks great. For VR, you want it faster. So what they actually did is they rendered out synthetic light fields. They take a little while to render these things out. And then it becomes a data structure that they can store in some of their compressed formats that you can then move around in. And it looks very realistic. And here it is basically what they would put into a DK2. And you can get computer-generated synthetic imagery that is um, amazingly realistic and detailed. And it responds uh, completely. Um, interactively as you move your head around, forward, back, up, down, left, right, and all kinds of rotations. So light fields came to the rescue uh, with that kind of uh, technology. Um, another person that I've gotten to work with at USC's Institute for Creative Technologies, um, I've gotten to work a bit with uh, light fields on, and that's uh, Professor Mark Bolas uh, from the Mixed Reality Lab. He's also a professor at the USC uh, School of Cinematic Arts. Uh, one of his uh, claims to fame is that at Fake Space Labs with his uh, partner Ian McDowell, he produced uh, something that as of three or four years ago possibly was the best VR headset ever made, the Wide 5 HMD, because it was lightweight, it had a 150 degree field of view, um, and uh, it had um, uh, very low latency. And in fact, word got out of this in the, to, the, to the, the, the nascent VR community at the time. He got some emails uh, from a particularly enthusiastic kid who just like really wanted to come and learn more about VR and what's going on in the lab. So he hired uh, a young fellow named Palmer Lucky to come be a lab assistant at the Institute for Creative Technologies uh, for about a year. And after being there for a, while, uh, for a while, Palmer had the idea, well, maybe you know, VR is ready. We could actually go you know, do a Kickstarter, sell this to gamers. And Mark wished him well. Uh, and uh, gave his blessing for all of that. And so uh, that's helped a lot of us uh, get here today. So I'm pretty excited to get to work with Mark over at the ICT. Uh, something really cool that he did and showed at this SIGGRAPH, uh, and we got to play with him a little bit on, is actually capturing light fields of stop motion characters. So working with the USC School of Cinematic Arts, where there's people who know how to do stop motion, they would animate this guy to a different frame and then this little array of cameras would shoot photos of him all the way around to get this light field data. And then working with a way to put this stuff into Unity, um, he was able to interactively get light fields of these little stop motion guys into the VR headset with head tracking. And what's great about it is you can do these things that have like all these weird translucent, squishy kinds of things that are really hard to do in CG. Um, and get them to be completely realistic with all their translucency and reflections and everything. And it's pretty lightweight, easy capture. It's kind of fun stuff to take a look at. And this won one of the, uh, the awards in the virtual reality um, space uh, at SIGGRAPH this year. 
Now, if you want to shoot light fields, there's actually other ways of doing it. You don't have to spin the object. We had to make a light field uh, of this uh, award plaque at one point, and so we set it uh, in front of a camera. There's a gantry, and we took about 4,000 pictures of it um, by just moving the camera instead of moving the object. And this didn't get us 360 around, but for the way we were going to display it, we didn't need that. We uh, used those AR markers to register everything. And as you can see, as you look at objects from different directions, you get very interesting, nice little specular reflections and things off of that. And this all got rebinned. We had a grad student named Joel Jurek uh, work on this project. And it produced some data that we sent to Zebra Imaging, which is a company that actually prints holograms uh, down in uh, Austin, Texas. And they shipped us back a uh, holographic version of this, which is basically a light field. And it has full parallax. You can see all the reflections. You can move around. And it's just enough that you can even uh, make out what the thing says on the, on the plaque writing. And there is this kind of nice connection between holograms and light fields. They're both basically four-dimensional uh, data sets, as, uh, and um, uh, there's a good connection there. Uh, a lot of us probably heard about light fields for the first time through a funny little camera that came out a couple years ago called the Lytro camera. Did anyone get a Lytro camera? And that, I, I, a heck of a lot of fun, these things. Uh, and they shoot light fields a little bit differently because um, Instead of moving you know, one camera to lots of different positions, um, they shoot it all at once with one big lens in front. And then there's just a regular image sensor back here that's 11 megapixels. And they have this tiny little array of lenslets. And so what those little lenslets do is it helps the individual pixels of the sensor uh, see not just you know, which part of the scene is focused on there, but which direction it came from as it hit the lens. And the whole idea about how uh, lenses uh, work is that they get more light to the sensor by gathering light over a whole area. And normally, in a normal camera, all of the light from a particular point in space that hits that lens focuses down to a particular pixel if it's in focus. And on the Lytro, that happens if it's in focus. But if it's out of focus, it actually ends up recording it over different pixels into different parts of these sub-images, which look like uh, this. So if you actually take those 11 megapixel images off of the sensor, they look like a whole bunch of little bubbles. And things that are in focus, the bubbles just look like you know, disks because every single direction of light hitting the front of that lens going on to that lenslet is going to be uh, the same ray. But if you're in focus a little bit too far forward or too far backwards, it actually starts turning into little views of the scene. The result is that you can refocus the image forward and back. And you can also play around with the viewpoint a little bit, as long as it stays within the opening of the lens. And that wasn't too big. They came up with another camera recently called the Illum. And that had a bit of a bigger uh, lens. And so you can play around a little bit more. So these are done in post-production off of single shots off the Lytro Illum. And you can see that it's actually able to not just change the focus, but you can feel there's a little bit of parallax change. So if we were going to take one of these Lytro images and try to put it into virtual reality, you know, maybe you could show a photo here and you could have like a little bit of ability to kind of move around if you made it feel like you're pretty small relative to the scene. Because remember, you've got to get both of your eyes within this tiny little circle here. Uh, if you wanted to shoot you know, a real light field of a bigger scene, you might want to assemble something that uh, Stanford, among other people, put together, which are light field camera arrays, where they're actually spaced the cameras out with quite a bit of distance, um, you know, right to left and up, to, up and down. And in fact, you'll actually notice that this is sort of reminiscent of something that we've seen used in the movies, maybe not with multiple rows. But the idea of shooting a scene with lots of cameras in a row is the kind of thing that produced a lot of uh, interesting uh, visual effects over the years, probably most notably in the Matrix. Here you can see an array of cameras that was used to uh, shoot Keanu Reeves as he was suspended by wires. And then once this was composited into a photogrammetrically reconstructed environment, it lets you feel that you're kind of virtually moving around him there. So it's kind of like a degenerate one-dimensional light field camera that was used to shoot this. Um, it's worth noting, of course, that the Matrix is not actually the place that uh, first introduced the technique. Um, 
the uh, uh, pioneering work for this was done by a really cool guy named Tim McMillan when he was doing his uh, BFA at the Bath Academy of Art in the early 1980s. And the one camera that he made in the mid-80s was this brilliant circular design. People would jump through, there'd be a flash, it would record views of him in all different directions onto a single piece of film. You'd pull that piece of film out, put it into a movie projector, and then you'd watch you know, what he called, and what I like to call, uh, time slice shots. And this particular shot of this dog, uh, which is pretty amusing, um, actually got people calling into the TV station when it got broadcast on Tomorrow's World because nobody had ever seen this stuff before. And when they saw this dog frozen in space uh, in the middle of a hoop, they could only assume that people had actually frozen a dog and thrown it through a hoop. <laughs> so there was some explaining that uh, had to be done uh, at that point. But anyway, the idea got out, the technique came out. In the mid-90s, uh, there, there was like a, a Gap commercial for khakis that used the technique. And there were even two movies that had time slice shots in it before The Matrix. Does anyone want to guess one or the other of the two movies we have here? Lost in Space, Lost in Space yes, correct. And other one, yeah. What's that? We are in a good audience. Let's hit him here, folks. Time slice before a bullet, bullet time, both out before The Matrix. And I put this in here also as a cautionary tale because Neither of these films did very well, and part of that is because neither of these films was very good. <laughs> or all of that. And um, this is wonderfully done, you know, time slice stuff. This one is particularly good here. Tim McMillan himself worked on this one. Uh, he's now a GoPro, by the way, so let's expect some interesting stuff coming out of GoPro uh, in the near future. Uh, but, you know, just having access to a really neat piece of technology, if you don't tell a good story with it, if you don't make a good product with it, it might someday be only the academics that remember you. So, <laughs> the, um, um, the thing, we've seen a lot of things where there's lots of cameras all around. Uh, we've done things in our light stages where we basically put lights all around people. And the idea was that we thought it would be cool to not just change the viewpoint on people in post-production, but to change the lighting on them in post-production. So we had our, our, in our big light stage six, which is, you know, still out there in Playa Vista, we uh, shot light fields of our friend uh, Bruce by slowly rotating him around on this turntable. And uh, we actually got to the point where he was jogging. But we shot him with high-speed cameras. So if you slow this down, we're actually very rapidly changing the lighting condition on him. So we're getting like 30 lighting passes on him in the course of like a normal 30th of a second frame of video. And so we can actually compute new lighting on him in post-production. And since we rotated him around 360 degrees and we had a couple cameras vertically, we got a light field for every point in his walk cycle. This is technically a seven-dimensional data set. We got a transparency map by kind of having one of the lighting conditions turns off the light on Bruce and we light up the background. So we can drop the background out. We can virtually spin the light around anywhere. We can take linear combinations of the color channels of the different conditions to, to relight him with different HDRI maps. Uh, this is real-time light field rendering of a point in his animation from about uh, 10 years ago now. And if we want to put him virtually into a scene running across with the right perspective and the right lighting since we had an HDRI map, we can drop him into some scene that he wasn't in and we can give him some shadows, we can give him some company. <laughs> and this could be a very nice element to put into a virtual environment. There's actually no 3D geometry of him. This is all based on images and it's relightable. And you can change the viewpoint <laughs> and you can take it a little bit um, uh, further. Um, we wanted to have some ways of actually showing this stuff in the real world, and before we had the VR headsets, I got to work with Mark Bolas and Ian McDowell uh, another time on a, uh, a kind of light field display. And this used uh, a rapidly spinning 45-degree um, mirror, it's actually an anisotropic reflector, with 4,000 frames per second of video projection on top of it. So once they're in sync, our somewhat overworked NVIDIA card rendering views of this head spinning around at 4,000 frames per second come together. And as one of our demos that we showed at SIGGRAPH 2007, we even put Bruce on there, his light field that you could actually look around in all different directions. And most recently, we've been using Light Stage 6, 
with an array of um, camcorders to record uh, testimony of survivors of the Holocaust. This is a project with USC Shoah Foundation and our institute's natural language group led by David Traum with the idea that if you have a whole week of interviews with somebody and it's shot from all these different points of view, that you would have the information necessary to put them onto some kind of futuristic hologram display and then virtually talk to them, ask them questions about uh, their history, about what happened to them uh, during the war, what happened to them since the war, and preserve this in a way that's going to be a little bit more easy to uh, be accessible than you know, videos on uh, YouTube. So actually at SIGGRAPH this year, and we have running at our institute, a uh, prototype um, auto stereo, auto multiscopic 3D display uh, built as an array of 216 video projectors all showing a different view interpolated up from the light field. And here's a graduate student, Koki Nagano, who's going to uh, uh, interview or ask Pincus a question. How did you survive the Holocaust? How did I survive? I survived, I believe, because Providence watched over me. And also, the fact that for a long time, my parents uh, watched over us and guarded us and kept us hidden for, for almost three and a half years, uh, both before the ghetto was closed and after the ghetto was closed. And then my father told me when we were taken to the death camp that I must say that I'm 18 years old because children were being murdered, you know, uh, all the time immediately. So I'll pause it there. But it actually produces this life-size three-dimensional image. You don't need 3D glasses. You've got stereo and you can move all the way down to the right, see them from one side uh, and to the left. And light fields helped us get there. We don't have vertical parallax. The right way to do that would actually be to have um, a whole two-dimensional array of video projectors that you would stare into. Uh, and that's going to be another grant application before that happens. But. Um, <laughs> You've probably seen there's a little bit of duality between how we project light fields and how we record light fields. And this is very interesting because what would be the ultimate light field video camera if you wanted to record environments for virtual reality? Well, you'd probably want to turn all these projectors into cameras and then aim them out to get all of the views of the scene that you would want to record. So this is uh, you know, something that uh, you know, I put up as a slide at a talk I gave at Stanford back in February. Uh, of around 150, uh, you know, I guess GoPros, all aimed out uh, from different positions with the idea that any ray of light hitting this ball is going to be pretty close to captured by one of these cameras so that then anywhere within the ball or maybe even a little bit extrapolated from it, you could generate all of the views that you would need to see in a VR environment. Well, this is obviously going to be an expensive process uh, to get all the GoPros. I don't want to have to pull out all the micro SD cards from there. Um, someone is going to build this at some point. It's going to be awesome. But we didn't want to wait to see what it might look like. And so uh, working with our friends at Otoy and talking to my friend Greg Downing from uh, X-Res, uh, I asked him if he could use one of his high-res um, uh, gigapixel panorama rigs with its pan tilt function if we could push the camera further forward by 35 centimeters and have it intentionally generate parallax as it takes all of the views and over the course of you know an hour or so photograph all of those positions that you would have had in that rig and so going over to Otoy's office once we had this there's the camera it's got a 180 fisheye on it it's, it's poked out. There's a, a, a high quality pan tilt rig. There's a second camera on there that's actually just a counterweight. And um, it's like, you know, it's going to weigh the same. And it was there. So, um, And then here it is going around. And it's taking a fisheye every time. Uh, and, it, it, and it moves about three centimeters between photos. And it gets eventually the entire sphere. So if you look out the windows in this source data, you'll see that the, the buildings shift relative to like the, the, the window frames and things like that. And it's picking up the parallax. And so as a result, when you put this into a headset, and you're about to see uh, you know, Jules Erbach from uh, Otoy uh, enjoying this light field, um, all this you know, image data, it's, it's, it's compressed nicely. It's on the graphics card. And then he can move his head around and produce uh, all of these views that you would like to see um, from these different points of view. And what's exciting about that 
is that a lot of the standard problems in 3D stereo virtual reality go away. You can move your head and it updates appropriately. You can twist your head and the stereo stays right. You can look straight up and the stereo is right. But the thing I'm most excited about it is that reflections on surfaces and translucency actually do the right thing as you move around. And you can see what things are made out of. You get this visceral sense that that's made out of wood, that's made out of stone, that's made out of glass. All of these reflections aren't painted onto the surfaces anymore, but they actually react and they give you a much, you can see reflections changing around in the scene here as you move your head back and forth. So hopefully we'll have a chance to see a lot more of our live action VR content recorded using light field uh, technology. There's some really interesting research problems to solve for that. But if there's any community that's gonna be able to help figure this out and then figure out the right ways to take advantage of it creatively, it's these folks right here at VRLA. These are the, a lot of the people I got to work with creating this work. Here's a couple of websites, that's all I have to say for now, and thank you very much.